this is the second part of molecules of life and we're going to talk about carbohydrates now those are probably everybody's favorite and it tends to be the case that we consume a lot of carbs whether you think that's good or bad is not really relevant at this point but everybody knows about them so you think about some carbs, I need some carbs, I need a slice of bread, I need some pasta, I need some pizza, right? There's some carbs in those. And clearly that is a very important food group for us. So what are they? Well, it may surprise you, but carbohydrates are actually sugars. Not all of them taste sweet, however. And when you think about the kind of molecule we talked about a few minutes ago hydrocarbons then what is different about these carbohydrates versus hydrocarbons there's obviously a difference but what exactly is it well it turns out that carbohydrates include some very small molecules but also some very large molecules the smallest ones of these tend to be used for energy Sugar, for example, what we would consider straightforward sugar, table sugar, is a relatively small carbohydrate, and it is primarily used for energy. There are larger ones, starch, like in, past, in pasta and, and potatoes, those would be used as storage molecules. Plants store energy in that manner. And then there are also some very strong types of carbohydrates, such as cellulose in plants. If you think about what cellulose actually is, a piece of wood, for example, is composed of primarily cellulose. So clearly it's strong, clearly it's used for structure, and it is not one of those that we would tend to eat. So obviously carbohydrates come in many different shapes and sizes and have different functions. But how do you build one of these? As I mentioned before in the first part, we need the monomer the single unit and the single unit of a carbohydrate is called a monosaccharide monosaccharide simply means single sugar they are the simplest of the sugars simplest of the carbohydrates and you only have a single sugar monomer for example glucose or fructose those are simple sugars monosaccharides Honey, as an example, has in it both glucose and fructose. So this is a natural product, and it's a, a, a well-distributed product throughout nature. Now let's take a quick look at the structure of these monosaccharides. One of the things that I want to show you is how they are different from carbohydrate, from hydrocarbons, pardon me, and how they are the same. So let's take a look at how they are the same. Well, clearly, when you look at this, there are carbons in a row, and there's hydrogen sticking out. Well, that's sort of a hydrocarbon characteristic. But in this case, you have a variety of functional groups. You have, in this case, carb uh, hydroxyl groups. One, two, three, four, five of these. Five hydroxyl groups. So, like I said before, you just stick on a bunch of these functional groups and strange things can happen. Plus, at the end here, you have your carbonyl group. So there are multiple functional groups attached to these. And in this combination, where you have both, where you have all hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen, that's what makes this a carbohydrate. Is the addition of oxygen to this, that's what makes it a carbohydrate. Now there are different ways by which you can display these structures. You have a, a different kind of layout, if you will. Um, the ring structure that is shown in the middle is the one that has all the details included in it. And by details, I mean, first of all, what is the position of these carbons? This is the first carbon. You count them a clock in a clockwise direction from this one on. So one, two, three, four, five, six carbons are there. And here are the equivalents. One, two, three, four, five, six. But how do you actually turn this linear structure into a ring structure? The secret is with this oxygen here. What you can do is you can take this bond here 
and split it. And then this bond is actually going all the way down here. All right, carbon one and carbon five, carbon one and carbon five, and that's how it forms the ring. Now it happens under different circumstances, different conditions. In some substances, different pH, it doesn't do it. But in our body, it tends to be the ring structure. It's in a liquid. That's how it, how it works. And because as biologists, we tend to be a little bit lazy and we don't want to clutter up our pictures like that, we can just take glucose in this case and just give you the abbreviated ring structure. We have the oxygen there and there's carbon one, carbon two, three, four, five, and wait a minute, we're not even showing carbon six anymore. We just leave all that stuff out. But that way you'll know what it is. It's glucose and that's how you show it. Now if you take some of these monosaccharides and stick them together using dehydration synthesis you can make disaccharides. So the next step up. Mono means one, di means two. Disaccharides therefore are double sugars. And in this case we have glucose and you can recognize glucose because it has the oxygen there. This is carbon one, this is carbon two, the way I just showed you. But now we're going to add it to galactose. Well, what's the difference? It still has the oxygen there, still has carbon one, carbon two, carbon three. Ah, but here it has an hydroxyl group at carbon four, whereas glucose has a hydroxyl group at carbon one. So here's an example of having just a very minor shift in functional groups, and you end up with a different molecule. So the difference between glucose and galactose is very small. And they still have the same number of carbons, of hydrogens, and of oxygens in the molecule. But the position of that hydroxyl group changes what that molecule does. And so if you take glucose and galactose together, you make something called lactose. And lactose is, of course, well known to people. This is milk. Those of you who are perhaps lactose intolerant, you probably know a little bit about lactose. And it shows you that when you take an individual building block and turn it into something just a little bit bigger, it's already different. Glucose tastes sweet. Lactose, not so much. Yet it has glucose as a component. So dehydration synthesis allows us to create these and other disaccharides. Other disaccharides include sucrose and maltose. Maltose, malt sugar. So if you take two glucose molecules and stick them together, that's what gives you maltose. And again, glucose is different than maltose and what it looks like, how it behaves, and it has a different taste and so on. The one that we're probably most familiar with is sucrose and that's because we use it every day and it's in all of our foods basically and it is composed of a glucose and a fructose. Now what's the difference there? If you look at the structure of these you can see here this is our normal uh, glucose and the fructose only has five peaks. One, two, three, four, five. It still has six carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's just instead of having only one sticking out, like in the glucose molecule, it has two sticking out. But if you were to count up all the carbons, you still end up with six. If you count up all the hydrogen you still have 12 and if you count up all the oxygen you still have 6. So again the chemical composition of these molecules, of these monosaccharides basically doesn't change. It's just the little bits and pieces and where they go. That's what changes. But you're getting such fundamentally different kinds of things. Now, of course, you probably know that most of our sugar comes from plant sap, in particular sugar cane and sugar beets. So it is a natural product, sugar is. 
It's different than fructose, it's different than glu glucose, but it is what primarily drives our sugar-based economy. Now, if you want to extend this and make longer chains, then, of course, you go from the single one to the double one to the many. That's now called a polysaccharide because poly simply means many. And when you look at many of these, that means sometimes several thousand units long. Several thousand units. Now, one unit of glucose has six carbons thousands that could be 6,000 carbons, 10,000 carbons, a lot of carbons regardless. So many in this case can be thousands. And on top of that, it's not just all thousand in a line. They could be straight. They could be branched, just like the hydrocarbons we encountered. Sometimes you make different connections, just as with the glucose and the galactose because different pieces go to different places so you can change that and as a consequence they can even be different when you look at different organisms and one of the fundamental differences between organisms is plants and animals and it turns out that plants have a slightly different set of polysaccharides that they use than we as animals use so let me give you some examples Starting here with starch, that's obviously a well-known plant polysaccharide. And let's just take a look at what it's made up of. If you look here on the upper right, you'll see that it's made up of glucose. So this is a glucose monomer, right? And there's the next one, there's the next one, there's the next one. So it's all glucose, a long line of glucose and it could be several thousand units long. That's starch. That's it. That's all it is, glucose. Now clearly, even though glucose may taste sweet, like in your, in your uh, Gatorade drink or something like that, clearly starch isn't particularly sweet. Right? Flour doesn't taste particularly sweet. But it's still made up of that stuff. It's just a long chain of it. Now, the second one of these is called glycogen. And glycogen is also a storage device, a storage molecule. And if you look at what glycogen is made up of, you'll realize very quickly, wait a minute, that's just glucose again. Glucose, 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 glucose. So what's the difference, glucose, glucose? Ah, here's the difference. Because from this point on, there's a branch that goes this way and another one that goes that way and there's another branch and so on so the difference between these here is that this one is unbranched whereas the glycogen is branched and this branching is a fundamental difference between the macromolecules in plants and in animals now, you can take this to the extreme and you look at what cellulose is. Remember that piece of wood? Now, if you take a look again at the end here, you'll see that, oh, okay, well, that's clearly glucose. That's glucose too, but if you look at where the oxygen is, it's glucose flipped around. This is right side up glucose. This is upside down glucose. This is right side up. This is upside down. This is right side up. This is upside down. And so it goes. So first of all, the chain is a little bit different. Now, if you place the chains with the glucose upside down like this next to each other, then something remarkable happens. Because of the way these are reversed and hung upside down, they can form a hydrogen bond. So there's a hydrogen bond, there's a hydrogen bond, there's hydrogen bonds, which connects these and makes this a much stronger molecule than any of these. So here now you have, in this case, is shown one, two, three of these glucose chains cross-connected 
by these hydrogen bonds that gives them some strength and then you build it together into cellulose so you have them running like this and running like that and then you end up with something that's really strong and that's one of the reasons why you can't eat this because you can hardly even chew it right so cellulose is really strong and because of the way these hydrogen bonds are pulling it together it's actually something that we cannot digest then the examples that are in the book there are some ways by which organisms can digest cellulose but it's not so easy we on the other hand don't really have problems digesting the simple things like starch simpler I suppose and we store things as glycogen so these are the polysaccharide examples and that concludes the part on carbohydrates <laughs>